Hi everyone, Daniel at Asheville here. Today, I'm in Soho to interview Andrew Southern of Southern Grove. I ran up a check, I might do it again. Enemies close, have me thinking they're friends. Ten toes down, I'll be free until the end. Crib outside the city, I don't feel safe in my ass. Took so many years, I'm just waiting for the wins. I'm in debt to no one but the one who took my sins. I do it for real, there's no reason to pretend. If I do it once, I do it again. Andrew is a large developer who works all over the country and he's also a very good friend of mine. I'm asked a lot of questions about the UK property industry and I always give my take from a moderate sized developer and a man in the thick of things on the ground. Andrew is a large scale developer, building everything from 40 storey towers to getting planning permission where they say it's not possible. Andrew has also been featured in multiple publications, whether it be on the news, podcasts, in newspapers. So I'm here to get his take on the UK property industry. Today is a little bit different. I am not in the messy yard. I am at Argyle Street in W1 with Andrew Southern. Andrew is what I would call a property mogul, and he's also a very good friend of mine. So I'll let Andrew introduce himself. My name is Andrew Southern. I'm uh, chairman of Southern Grove and Future Generation, amongst other things. The reason I'm interviewing Andrew today, other than him being a great friend of mine, is I'm inundated on different platforms with people asking me about the property industry. Now, I do know quite a lot about the property industry. However, Andrew knows a lot more than I do. <laughs> Andrew is very experienced in the property game and he's actually been very successful also. And hopefully with the questions I ask, he can share some of his secrets with us here today. So how did you get started in property? I'm from Sheffield originally, as you know. I've been in London uh, 22, 23 years now. Uh, I've been in construction and property, you know, sort of my adult life, if you like, post, uh, post university. Um, and even taking a further step back, I probably was doing work experience in, in, in property construction related stuff from about 16 years old. So I did work experience and I recommend this for anyone whilst I was at school. And then I was fortunate enough to get a, a scholarship to go to Penn State in the States. That opened my mind in terms of travel, but also there's a big, you know, worldwide um, place where you can, you can go and make your mark. And it opened up my mind to all sorts of things when I was out in, in Penn State. And then I came back in my final year and finished my uh, master's degree at University of Leeds. All the way through that, I always did work experience, sat alongside the people that knew, you know, learned around the subjects, the different subject matter, and that ultimately culminated in me getting into construction and property. So Andrew, uh, tell us about the names of your businesses and what they do. The, uh, the larger company is Southern Grove Real Estate, which trades as Southern Grove. Uh, that business has been in operation for about seven and a half years. Um, and the name came about obviously from my name, Andrew Southern. I suppose our core business is residential. You know, we're all about residential. That's how you and I met. But I was really looking for a brand that people could sort of listen to, uh, being honest. It, it had my name in it and not unlike yourself, Dan Lashville, Louise. Uh, something you'd be proud of, you know, a legacy. Future Generation is different. Uh, we went out and did a, a competition on that. We tried to come up with a new idea for, for student housing uh, and the Future Generation logo seem to sit quite comfortably because ultimately people are investing in their education, they're going to university and, and, and what you want to do in any, in any walk of life is be well educated as best you can um, and, and look after the future generation so it seemed like a natural, natural thing to do to associate with study in the built form. Future Generation is uh, what we call PBSA. PBSA, which is Purpose Built Student Accommodation, which is accommodation built for students by private developers. There are two types. One is a cluster, which is studio flats with private kitchens and shared living spaces. The second is the no sharing option, where you have a studio flat with a kitchen, bathroom and living area all self-contained. Smaller rooms for students that are designed specifically for those students with communal spaces where they can uh, go and learn, better prepared for you know, the future that lies ahead. And how do you feel about the property market in its current state? If you ask me today what my view on, on residential prices is, as, as I was quoted in the press the other week, um, they've probably come off a little bit. It's a buyer's market rather than a seller's market. A buyer's market. This is an economical situation where potential buyers have multiple options, therefore they're able to keep the prices down. But the long-term prognosis for UK um, accommodation and, and residential is, is very, very strong indeed. And what about the other sectors, commercial and student? 
Um, well, a lot of people are down on, on commercial at the moment. Obviously, we're sat in, in my office, two metres apart, I hasten to add. One of the reasons we opened our office is because, you know, members of our finance team, for example, wanted to come back to work. They wanted to be part of, of the team. And you miss that camaraderie on Zoom calls. Do I think working attitudes will change? 100% they will. Will people go into work less? Yeah. Will they spend more time with their families? Yeah. I think a, a lot of positive stuff will come out of this very, very um, challenging time. Uh, but, you know, people will still have offices, will still want a place to go, uh, but they'll do things in a slightly different way. You mentioned something earlier. You mentioned that it's a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by a buyer's market? Well, typically, <coughs> typically in the UK, you have a buyer's market or a seller's market. It's not unless like stocks and shares. Um, I think last year was, was a very much a transitional year, 2019. We had the backdrop of, of, of Brexit. We then had uh, anything that sends you know, the economy and property and housing with the general election, Corbyn versus Boris. We got through that period and actually this year we're starting to look like a very, very strong year for the property sector. And then of course we got hit with COVID. Are there still deals which are coming onto your table? Do you, are you as buoyant as you were previously or have you taken the foot off the gas a little bit? We've put our foot on the gas. So we have bought, we've acquired um, a position on five sites in five months. So I don't know many other developers that have done that. They are deals that have been working on for the last 18 months. So it's not like we just picked up the phone and started going through the yellow pages. These are sites that we've been working on uh, and working with the owners for quite some time. It just so happens that we close those sites this year. Those sites will take 18 months to secure planning consent, 24 months. Planning permission. This refers to the permission needed to expand, construct, convert or demolish. But bear this in mind, for some properties, you'll need a bit more than planning permission from the local authority. If it's a conservation area or it's a listed building, you'll need further permissions. So we really will be out of where we are with COVID in 18 to 20 months time, 24 months time. So we think it's a buyer's market. If you're going to sell at the moment and you have to sell and you're forced to sell, you might be willing to have you know, some small haircut just to, to get what you want. What do you say for the um, moderate sized developer who likes to buy a house, uh, convert it, and then sell it. Do you think those days are finished or? I think that will inherently stay. I think people are, in the last year, lots of people have spent money on their own properties and whether it's a house extension or interior design, a lot of people uh, watching this will understand about the need to have a really good quality kitchen, you know, a master suite for the person paying the bills, etc., etc. But again, it depends on the price point, how much you're gonna spend on it and what your exit is. Um, the biggest challenge on residential in today's market, the biggest single challenge is stamp duty. Stamp duty is a tax placed on a single property purchase or a document, for instance, a lease. Stamp duty is applicable whether you buy a freehold or you buy a lease. And the amount of stamp duty is based on the value of the purchase. Because I don't think it, it, it's fair. I don't think it works, to be quite honest. Um, and certainly on the upper end of the market, uh, it hasn't worked at all. You know, property prices have dropped considerably in the upper end of the market. But, you know, you, you've got to do property to all different types of levels and different incomes. Um, and that's where it gets challenging. I mean, what I would like to see, you know, twisting the question around a little bit, I'd probably like to see slightly more of an American system. You don't, you don't get penalised on the way in to buying a property. You then, like cash flow, you service the, the tax, if you like, on the property on an annual basis, depending on your income. I think that's a much uh, fairer way of doing it. I think that it will raise more money for the public purse, which will then go into you know, improving public services. Uh, and it ends up with a you know, natural hierarchy, whereas if you can service a certain amount of cost per year, so if the value of your property is a million pounds, you, know, you might be able to spend a thousand pounds a year on property tax. If it's a 250,000 pounds, you might be able to spend 250 pounds on annual property tax. But buying into a property when you're buying and also when you're selling is a big issue that, you know, on a half a million pound property in, in, in London now, you have to find £20,000 deposit to do so. So even with help to buy now, you can't use leverage. Leverage is an investment strategy. This is basically where you use your money to borrow more money. And hopefully when you borrow more money, you can get into bigger deals and hopefully have bigger returns. Leverage means money from the bank. You can't use leverage for that deposit. You have to save up that deposit and to save up for that deposit after tax and not just after tax but then after your living expenses takes a long 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 time so i, I think there needs to be some dialogue about how you do that um, but going back to your question if you find a property and you can 
you know, get the space and design from the inside out, get the spatial arrangement right, get the right finishes in, get the right budget, there is always going to be someone to buy it if it's well considered in the right location. And you mentioned, um, might be a bit controversial, about changing stamp duty and stamp duty is not working. Um, some of you might not know this, Andrew is a very good friend of Boris himself. Have you mentioned this to him? Uh, no, no we, don't, we, don't, we don't talk about that per se, but um, I've certainly spoken to some of his advisors and the housing minister, and there is uh, people lobbying and, and, and trying to talk this through. The, the problem is if, if you've owned a property for a long, long time, and then you bring in annual property tax and you're not paying any tax, that's quite difficult. I would say, you know, some very, very wealthy people wouldn't like me for, for, for suggesting such things. But I, I just think it's a much fairer way of doing it. And to be honest, there are a load of other ideas around the world as well, which could be a lot fairer. But I, I think to have these thresholds, I mean, on, on the upper end now in London, you're looking at a 13% tax and you're not going to get that growth. And so it doesn't work. Well, that means that people won't sell. Well, if they don't sell, then people can't move into that property. And so the whole thing starts to break down on a micro and, and, a, and a macro level. From years ago, I always remember everything was residential and commercial. And then I remember you said, right, Daniel, I'm, bu I'm building a 40-story tower for students. Mm -hmm. Speak to it. What was your thinking behind moving into the student sector? You know, I remember years ago, you know, I used to go, I used to rearrange my bedroom to maximise the space in my room. I mean, I, do, I just do that on a much larger scale now. My view is that education is sort of recession-proof. Education is recession proof. Andrew believes that the student market is recession proof because people will always want to be educated. And actually, in times of economic difficulty, people actually go back to studying more. And that's why I went into PBSA because as a parent, you always want your, your child to have the best, you know, the best that you possibly can be and give it the best possible opportunities. Uh, and obviously that's in terms of the education the institution they go to, but also where they lay their head and the environment that they're in, one of the key sort of drivers from us is that a lot of people were building student accommodation 10 years ago and they were doing it all in primary colours. I said, why are you doing it in primary colours? Well, they're, they're learning. Yeah, but these, these are young adults. These people are 18 right through to 30 if they're mature students. They don't want to live in brightly coloured rooms and certainly not in brightly coloured buildings. So what we did as Future Generation, we, we ended up with a more sophisticated uh, palette, um, hopefully uh, the external buildings are architecturally expressive and, and, and trigger ideas and imagination and thoughts. Would you say that you need a different skill set to work in residential, to work in commercial, to work in student? Would you say it's a different skill set or it's transferable or...? It's transferable, but you, you need uh, experience and expertise. I'll give you an example. So when I first started out, you know, one of my first projects actually behind you on that wall, Black Lion House, uh, that's actually service departments. So on this one, you know, I work with, you know, Seiko, and the guys there and I learned about it. But a lot of what I do and a lot of what you do as well is joint ventures. Joint venture, also known as a JV. This is where two completely separate entities come together to form a new entity while both keeping their individual identities. This could be done for any sort of business deal or single transaction. E each site's different. You know, it might be the landowner wants the money now. He might want the money in six months time or he's willing to wait 18 months or he might want to come on the journey or he might want a hybrid approach where he has some money now and then he works alongside you. It very, very much depends on that individual or collective individuals and what they want and what works for you. Hybrid approach. This is where you create a bespoke deal within the JV for a specific project. What else do you think the government could do could, to help boost the property industry? Finance. I think finance is, is a big one and joint ventures. I think if the government wanted to, um, they could use their assets that they retain on behalf of the people. They could use their clout, both with the banks, like they have done during COVID. And would you say that the, that the government gives assistance to, to larger corporations, or do you feel that it, it's fair, or? Not really, I mean, I think you've seen that with COVID. I mean, there's a, they've, they've come with some general rules um, that sort of work, but I'm sort of saying that, you know, that I think they should engage with, you know, people like myself and, and other developers more and, and come up with different and unique solutions. What importance would you put on business relationships? This basically means that the people within your circle, within the sector, can help you and your project whenever you face challenges. Business relationships uh, are, are key, are critical. And like any relationships, um, we spend a lot of time working on relationships. Trust is very, very important. Integrity. For example, our investors, they need to know that they're going to get the returns, that we're, you know, we're good people with good values. 
And we spend a lot of time both in the workplace developing relationships, but also out of the workplace. It's fair to say I've kissed a few frogs on the way up, you know, some people I wouldn't choose to, um, to hang out with or have dinner parties with, but you know, business is business and you can't get on with everybody, uh, but as long as you treat people with respect, then that's the most important thing. Uh, give me an example, um, for instance, you were stuck on a project or you hit a brick wall and relationships which you formed over the years were able to help you. It was actually in, in construction. Um, it was actually in banking, believe it or not. And, and obviously a part of property development is to do with everything from raising finance to getting the agent on side to the construction, the planning, etc., etc. Um, you know, I, I was struggling uh, opening a, a set of bank accounts for, for a refinance we did on our student portfolio and uh, I wasn't really, you know, getting anywhere. And I think part of the reason was uh, that I tried to do it in a large forum with lots of different people, lots of different views. When I actually uh, picked up the phone and chatted to that individual on a one-to-one -one basis, I think it made you know, a big difference. That comes just through experience and, and ultimately it's about making the right decision at the right time. You've said that to me for a number of years. And it's the same in the business and personal life. If you make the right decision at the right time, you're gonna be you know, certainly better equipped than, than most people. And, and the right decision there was I picked up the phone I said, what's the issue? I don't want to know a large forum. Because we were talking on a one-to-one -one basis, we went through the challenges. Within a week, those challenges were cleared and all of a sudden we're off and, and, and uh, you know, we're off in the same direction. We, you and I have had it over, over the years as well. You, know, you get a tricky situation. You know, it's not, you know, you will hit challenges in the construction and property industry as you do in all walks of life. But it's not, you know, that's not the issue. The issue is how you get around those issues, you know. I'd like to give an example of relationships myself. I know we're interviewing Andrew, but my relationship with Andrew. So, um, yes, as a growing um, construction company, um, we came up against a project and looking at the project from, from the outset, um, you could say that possibly this project would be too big for Asheville to take on. But obviously I'm raring to go and Andrew knows me personally and in business and Andrew says, I guarantee that Asheville will deliver. And Andrew was able to bring Asheville into the project. It was the largest project we had done to date. I'm very proud of the project as part of our portfolio. And if it hadn't been for the relationship with Andrew, I don't think that we would have got that project. And now I've developed relationships with other people, i.e. the architect, the structural engineer, the client. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember that. Uh, I remember that project well, and uh, it did work very, very well. I mean, the, it, it works both ways. Like any good relationship, you know, I got comfort from the fact that you were delivering the project because I knew that I could pick up the phone. Like you pick up the phone when you go and chat to your mate in the pub. You know, it's a similar sort of thing. And I just knew that you were delivering. You wouldn't let me down. And that's where trust is really, really important. Um, I think if you've got the trust. You know, and you're intelligent, then you're going to do well in business. And then when your level is determined by how hard you work. And those are the three main factors I, I decide as to whether you're going to be a good you know, business person, you know, man or woman. What advice would you give to aspiring property developers and any entrepreneurs? One, uh, you have to be you know, intelligent. Two, you have to work particularly hard. Three, you have to engender you know, long-term fruitful and positive relationships. Four, you need to be good with numbers. Five, you have to have a view on design and product. You have to. You know, you're designing places and building places where people live. So design from the inside out, make sure it's in a good location, and make sure your numbers stack up. Design from the inside out, I like that. I mean, one of the reasons why I love hospitality is that if you go to a nice hotel, it's four or five star hotel, and you go into a suite or a room, all right, and you're with the love of your life or whatever it is, and you're in that room and you wake up in the middle of the night and you need to go to the toilet, right? So you reach out with your right hand or your left hand and you're looking around for a light switch. Or maybe it's got a proximity switch where you get up or the underside of the bed's lit up and you make your way to the bathroom and then you come. Either way, that is an experience. That moment, that 20, 30 seconds of going to the bathroom in the middle of the night and coming back is an experience. And what you need to do in property is try and bottle that experience to make sure it's an experience you want to do it again. This is my favourite, bottling experiences. This means wherever you go, if you have a great experience within a property, you remember that idea, try and keep it, and then you try to implement that into your project. So whenever I go to a hotel, I'm always learning about how things work, what works, what doesn't work, and how I'd like to translate that into my own bedroom at home. And that's how I think you should be thinking all the time. 
And, and when there's a recession, if you've got a good product and a bad product, the good product will always sell. And the person that didn't spend the time, the effort designing it from the inside out will struggle to sell. And what does the future hold for Southern Grove and Future Generation? We're now going to do a co-living brand. So co-living is, is similar to PBSA, but it means smaller residential units that you can rent. Yeah. And then the next brand we're going to do is a built to rent brand. So as we see, it's like stepping stones. You've got one, going to university education. Two, you come out of that, you get your first job. Obviously, if you didn't go to university, you go straight into two. And then once you get to a point where you're going up the ladder or you're getting a slightly higher income or you've met someone, you've got joint incomes, then you move into the build to rent products, which is you know, a, a larger flat, whether it's one bed, two bed, three bed, etc. You may be with a partner with someone, but it's the evolution of your income. Right, so that'll be it for today. I'd like to thank Andrew of Southern Grove and Future Generation of sharing his knowledge with us. Thank you, Andrew. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, Daniel. Thank you for having me. There have been times in the past when I've been in meetings and people have used big words and phrases and I didn't know what they meant. Hopefully, after watching this, you've learned a bit and it's armed you with what you need for any property meetings that you may be sat in. Let us know in the comments if there's any parts of this that you'd like us to go into further detail and remember to subscribe. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Wait, hold on, no, 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 wait, hold on, did I, did I miss one? <laughs>